to welcome you all here today um, for our presentation by uh, Mr. DeLacy Wyman. Um, and I've been looking forward to this talk tremendously um, ever since I, I got to know, Maul and I are essentially neighbors out in Farragut. So um, it was a great pleasure to find out that right nearby was somebody with unique experience and someone who um, had reflected and had spoken in public about his, uh, his time in Vietnam. Uh, and, but for my own interest in the Cold War, um, I was so glad that we would be able to bring to campus someone with an amazing and unique experience of having served from 1969 to 1970 as a U.S. Air Force Minuteman Missile Launch Control Officer at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Um, I have uh, Mr. Wyman's um, CV in front of me, his resume, and um, it's striking uh, how uh, he's had both civilian experience and his, his time in the, the Air Force. Um, and his time in the Air Force finished off with um, his attaining the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and then working here at the Air National Guard Base uh, as well. Um, ask him if you get a chance about his civilian experience uh, in terms of city planning. Um, uh, he uh, earned his Master of Science in Planning here at the University of Tennessee in 1975. Uh, and then went on to a career um, on the Knox County and Knoxville Metropolitan Planning Commission, the Tennessee State Planning Office, uh, and was senior planner at Guilford County in North Carolina. Uh, and we're delighted to have him back, back to us in, uh, in Knoxville. Um, uh, and his presentation today is entitled, The Cold War History and Development of the Minuteman Missile, Perspectives of a Missile Combat Crew Commander. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Wyman today. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, a little bit on, on background. Uh, I'm originally a Yankee. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay? We won't hold it against you. Yes. <laughs> and I say originally because uh, I was born in, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia General Hospital, which is no longer there. It's near the train station. I was raised across the Delaware River in Burlington County, New Jersey, and from, from Philadelphia, you can either use the Betsy, Betsy Ross Bridge to get across, or the Benjamin Franklin Bridge. We're talking about history. Okay, and there's many others, but anyhow. Uh, so I uh, was raised in Burlington County, New Jersey, and my first uh, grades, they didn't have kindergarten, but anyhow, from one to six, I, in the public school. And then starting in the seventh grade, my parents decided that I should go to private school. So I went to a place called Admiral Firegate Academy. Now, I don't know if you all are, uh, know that uh, Admiral Firegate was the first admiral in the United States Navy. He was born uh, pretty close to Mississippi uh, and North Shore Drive. Okay? I attended Farragut from the seventh through the twelfth grade and graduated and was the battalion commander there my senior year, okay, at Farragut. It was a, it was a, the nation's first preparatory school in naval training. Okay? Started in nineteen thirty-three. It's not there anymore. They went into bankruptcy and uh, built houses. Okay. I uh, graduated from Farragut and uh, I went to uh, Bucknell University in central Pennsylvania. Bucknell is a liberal arts school. They have engineering and other things, but it's primarily a liberal arts co-ed. Here I've been to a military school for five years. I had, initially I had a little difficulty <laughs> sitting next to a female, but get over it. Uh, and I graduated from Bucknell in 1961 with a BA, not in history, but in allied field, in political science with kind of a minor minor in English. Okay, so uh, when I went to college, the first two years of ROTC are mandatory, and Bucknell they had Army. Okay, but I knew about the military. 
Andy Ferry. But I didn't want to, I didn't continue on with that after the first two years. And I didn't realize the significance of it until I graduated. Because as soon as I graduated, I mean within just two weeks, I got a letter from the Selective Service Board. It's a draft board. It says you will report to Newark, New Jersey. To take your pre induction physical into the United States Army at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And I thought, you know, um, I don't know how to fire the M4, but I'm sure I'll, I would learn. Or it's not the M4, the M1. <clears throat> but I think I can maybe do a little better. <laughs> Nothing against the Army. <laughs> okay? You know, he's Air Force. Anyhow, so what did I do? I enlisted in the Air Force. Okay? An audible alternative. I took, to I took the test for officer training school before I enlisted. And I, I, it, you had to go up to uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where there was an Air Force depot. It was two days. The first day was the written part. Second, second day, the medic board. And, and it went okay. But, I got a letter of non-selection to OTS because at that time they said they were taking candidates who had uh, the ability for being a pilot, navigator, or certain engineering fields. So I uh, said so I enlisted, went to San Antonio for, at that time it was eight weeks of basic training in the Air Force and got assigned to Sky Air Force Base in Illinois Air Weather Service and Information Service. Had me doing what's called cut lines <clears throat> for photos. You know, you see a photo, and that was one thing when I got interviewed and enlisted. The fella said, uh, "Okay, you went to college, you did this, put you in information systems service." So <clears throat> this was in uh, early '62. In May of '62, my folks called me and said that uh, they had sent me a letter telling me that I had been accepted to officer training school as a civilian. So they said, well, what are we going to do? What should we do? I said, send me the letter. I didn't have email back then. So they sent me the letter, and I went to the personnel officer, and I said, uh, what, what, uh, what can we do to, what can I do to go to OTS? He said, you go back, you talk to your first sergeant, you talk to your company uh, as a squad, your squad commander, and so on and so forth. He didn't want me to go. But the personnel officer is a chief warrant officer, W4, okay? He said, not to worry. So I'm gonna cut your orders, you go to the orderly room, Check out, leave your orders there. We're going to take a bus to St. Louis. We're going to send you back, back down to San Antonio for 12 weeks of OTS. So I was a 90 day wonder, got commissioned to second lieutenant. My first assignment after I got commissioned, guess what? Right here in Tennessee at Seward Air Force Base in Smyrna. That's where I met my wife. I was in supply. Seward was a C 130 base. And at that time, the C-130s, well, these were under tactical air command fighters, and they, and they had C-130s because when the fighters would deploy, <coughs> you know, like four at a time, and then you'd have pre-positioned kits that you load up on a C-130 and follow the fighters. And then when all 16 aircraft got there, you had the rest of it. So that's what I did. Then I got an uh, assignment to uh, Athens, Greece. They had a little way station there, the Air Force did. And from uh, 65 until the end of 67, we had a two and a half year assignment in Greece, which sounds like it could have been great fun, but what happened, you had the six day Arab Israeli war. 
there was a coup in Athens. Okay, so when my time was up, what did the Air Force do? They sent me to Vietnam for a year. Okay? Uh, it was a fighter base, F 100s. We, got, we had 64 F 100s, we had four squadrons. We had two squadrons of C 7A characters, like the many C 130. I was in supply and support. Okay. My year before I left uh, Vietnam, I wanted to get assigned to Pease Air Force Base in New Hampshire because the Wymans came over from England and settled outside of Boston. I wanted to get up there. So that's what I put in for. Pease was a strategic air command base. So uh, I got my orders in SAC. Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri. Missile launch officer. Okay? And to be uh, colloquial, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, if you'll pardon the expression, I got circumcised. <laughs> okay? I had no background, none whatsoever, full disclosure. None whatsoever. I had a struggle with algebra and geometry in high school. I took geology at Bucknell for science, you know, the rock boxes. So they put me in missiles, okay? I went to Chinook Air Force Base, in Illinois. Okay, I came back from Vietnam at the end of December, or before Christmas. There was no transition, none whatsoever. You know, when the diver goes down 250 feet, they just don't come zoop back right up. But back then, it didn't make any difference. In January, I found myself at Shunin Air Force Base in Illinois. And if you want to talk about cold, you went to, you were in Chicago? Who, who was in Chicago? I'm in Chicago. Yeah. He's well, from Wisconsin. You know all about it. Okay. <laughs> and then they sent, they sent you out to uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So it was probably uh, six months altogether. I was really struggling, you know, and it was social promotion. They needed missile officers. They kept pushing me through. Oh, you you get to your base, you'll find out, blah, blah, blah. I got there. And when I had my first check ride, you get in a, a missile train. Okay, it's about a six hour deal. You come out of that, you're dragging. Well, I didn't do well. And they said, in the evaluation, Captain Wyman does not have the ability to be a missile launch officer. And they were right. <laughs> they pulled me right out of the capsule, I mean, back in supply. And I knew that that was a kiss of death as far as career promotion. So what did I do? Went off active duty, came back to UT in 1970, started on my master's. It took me five years to get, because I had three masters. I had UT, I had my wife, and I had the guard out of McGee Tyson. And you have to juggle that. Okay. <coughs> so, got my master's, and got in planning and stayed in planning until we came back here in May of 07. Uh, I left planning, I was director of planning in the county, Guilford County before I retired. But getting in the guard was the best thing that ever happened. Because uh, when I got to the to guard, uh, they had what they call KC-97 uh, refueling aircraft, a four engine turboprop. And this was in 75, I guess. Vietnam was winding down. SAC didn't know what they were going to do with their KC 135s, and the guards said, Give them to us. And they did. And I'd been in SAC, and I said, Guys, we don't want to be sacrificed. So we got, we got up to speed. So, make a long story short, now that, that's it. So, 
what I'm going to try to explain to you is uh, my experience as a, a missile uh, combat crew uh, commander, Minuteman 2, now there's Minuteman 3. So, okay, the timeline, we're going to go through this real fast. When you talk about the, the Minuteman or, the, or the, the intercontinental ballistic missile, you have to go back to the Manhattan Project. There were two bombs, Little Boy and Fat Man, okay? And, let me read this up here. Right? Am I going too fast for you? Or? Okay. So, as far as the Manhattan Project, was approved on December 28, 1942. Okay, the purpose, design, build, and provide a timely bomb to end the Cold War in the Pacific. Not the Cold War, but World War II in the Pacific. Okay? And August 1945, Noel Gay dropped Little Boy, the gun type uranium 235 on Hiroshima. And then August 9, 1945, Boxcar dropped fat man, plutonium based. Now that was, plutonium was out of uh, Hanford. And the uh, fat man, uranium was Oak Ridge, right here in Oak Ridge. Still, Oak Ridge, the Y 12 plant is still here. You're going to build a new uranium processing facility. It'll be the largest, in the United, largest construction in the United States. Right out here. <laughs> okay. Soviet program. There were three spies that worked at uh, Los Alamos. Okay, there were three sites for the Manhattan Project. Oak Ridge, uh, Hanford, Washington, Tony and Oak Ridge, Uranium, and Los Alamos, where they practiced, where they actually, where they actually did uh, hydrogen explosion. So these, these three spies, uh, Klaus Fuchs, Theodore Hall, and David Greenglass, they worked at Los Angeles on a plutonium bomb, and they, they gave the information in the, that they had. In the, so uh, in 49 Soviets exploded RDS-1 bomb, which really resembled the fat man. Soviets developed bigger, more powerful bombs, but what they perceived to be a disadvantage in the accuracy and reliability of their delivery system. So we, we go to the cold, the beginning of the Cold War in '47, and and I look at about four or five different things. And please tell me if I'm wrong. But the best I can tell you is that 1947 is the beginning. Point. And as far as the early developments of ICBM, uh, there was a lot of controversy in the Air Force with fixed wing bombers, cruise missiles, and then ICBM, you know. It, it sort of went back and forth. Uh, 52, the uh, U.S. De de uh, detonated the hy hydrogen bomb, which they said was to guarantee our security, and so <laughs> Soviets in 53 detonated theirs. Then in, also in 53, it's what's called the thermonuclear breakthrough. The Atomic Energy Commission developed a high-yield, lightweight atomic weapon, making the ICBM feasible over the cruise missile. So in 54, uh, they started Project Atlas for the Atlas program. Now there's two, the Killing Report and Colonel Hall. Colonel Hall, he's, he's my guy. Not just because he's Air Force, but I'll tell you about it. The Killing Report, uh, was, that report resulted in President Eisenhower's signing the highest priority for the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program. And, um, 
to show you or to, to explain to you what happened with missile program. And I can say that was the first operational ICBM. Okay? Uh, used liquid fuel. Still using liquid fuel. Used it for both the Atlas and the Titan. And this, this is dangerous. It's highly toxic. And I, sus I suspect that there were some spills and other things that happened, but uh, I couldn't find anything about that. So there were 132 that were operational from December 62 through May of 64, and they were superseded by the Titan and the ICBM. Uh, the Titan program was an alternate to the Atlas. It was the largest ICBM ever developed. And I don't know if you'll notice that when they launch these uh, weather satellites and those kind of different things, they, they will use either an Atlas or a Titan for that boost. Really powerful. Is everybody okay so far? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it was, uh, so it says, as with the missile, that was the missile, the Titan, but the fuel propulsion was, took too much time to prepare for launch and was a potential safety hazard. There were 50, 54 Titan 1s and 54 Titan 2s. And the best that I can figure out, uh, the launch center, the launch control center had either one or three missiles. In the Minuteman, the launch control center had 10. You were responsible for 10 missiles. On your computer screen, you had 10 green lights. One of them went off, and you had to respond the best you could. Okay. So the Minuteman came on, came on in 60, 62, Minuteman 1, first solid fuel. 
became operational at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 62. Uh, I think you remember that in 61, in July, I guess it was July, the Soviets started building the uh, Berlin Wall. And I think we all, we, we're hearing a lot on, on the news about wanting to build a wall. Remember? Okay, well, this, this one was there until uh, the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, or right before that. So, uh, basically the Miniman 1, as with the other Miniman uh, 2 and 3, is a deterrence role, threatening. It was threatening the Soviet cities with a second strike counterattack. But if they struck first, believe me, none of us, none of this would be here. None of it. Just because when I was assigned to missiles in uh, 1969, there were 950 Miniman 2s, which means there were 95 launch control centers. Each one had 10 missiles. Okay? And we simulated, but we never, oh, that reminds me. One of the things that the Air Force did, and there's nothing written on this that I found, but this is what we were told. And I have every reason to believe that we did. We gave the Russians the, uh, what's called cancel launch in progress, flip. That is, if the missile is coming out of the silo, it's not in the boost or ascent stage, you know, where you have the perigee. You have the capability to shut that down. Now, I've never seen it, but you have that, it's a fail safe, okay? So, maybe somebody research that to find out about it. I only have, and by the way, everything, all this discussion comes from the internet. That notebook right there, all of that comes from the internet. So my wife, when she would ask me, what in the hell are you doing? I want to find out about the Minuteman missile. So, uh, deterrence role, and then Minuteman, uh, ICBM force modifications called I used to hear that all the time as a missile missile crew. Force mod, force mod, I didn't even know what the heck they were talking about. But I figured, well, maybe I'll be the one to test or something. Okay, the, the project was to completely retrofit the Minuteman launch one launch facility. The launch facility is the silo, the launch control centers. The launch control facility and whatever ground crew. So that, that happened in 63, 65. Minuteman 2 entered service, upgraded to improve, improve accuracy and survivability. Again, against the Soviet uh, anti ballistic missile system. And then in 1970, Minuteman 3 came along and it was the, the one of the important things about the Miniman 3, it could have what's called a MERV, multiple independent reentry vehicle. So you could have three, three warheads on one uh, ent entry vehicle. You know, you'd have a three of them. But uh, <clears throat> so with three warheads, it really made it much more difficult uh, to attack by an adversary. But the, the strategic arm reduction talks came along and it reduced it back to a single warhead. And 
minutes. As far as I know, that's what we have now. Each one has a single. It's 33. And the warheads <clears throat> are refurbished here in Oak Ridge or in Texas at the Pantex plant. Oak Ridge also refurbishes the uranium. As I told you, they're building, they're going to build this UPF uranium processing facility soon. And then lastly, bottom, bottom paragraph, at the height of the Cold War, there were more than 1,200 man ICBMs. The Russians had 1,400. And uh, now there are 450 on alert, 24-7, 150 at Mounts from Air Force Base, why not Air Force Base, North Dakota, and Francis C. Francis C. in the warm. And so do you all have questions about that? If we're running, uh, we have. Yes. You mentioned a moment ago that you suspected that the liquid fuel for I don't recall if it was either the Atlas or the Titan. You suspected that there were fuel spills. Um, at, I don't think you said where. I'm curious where and what makes you suspect that? Why? Yeah. I'll tell you exactly why. I'm glad you asked me that. After I got off of active duty, I'm sacked with missiles. I came out to the Air National Guard to be Tyson. And because I was in supply, uh, they put me in uh, aircraft refueling, ground refueling. Okay? Alright. You know, there's a pretty elaborate procedure, and it goes real, real fast when you're refueling an aircraft on the ground. Occasionally, occasionally, there is a fuel spill. Not very often, but occasionally. Now, with the liquid fuel for the Atlas and Titan, Titan, I mean, you had four or five trucks. You had uh, just, you know, liquid oxygen. You had everything. And like, like I say, there's nothing that I could find. I'm not sure if I went deep enough. Yes, sir. Well, you know there was a Titan down in Louisiana that blew up because somebody dropped a wrench down at yeah. the bottom. Yeah, that it was, it was uh, my hometown, Searcy, Arkansas. Oh, yeah, it's Arkansas. <laughs> I, uh, it's the town I grew up in. That was, yeah, it, it caused a spark. Yeah. And he blew the warhead out of the silo on yeah. the ground next to it and killed the So <laughs> this is all, uh, what's the word I want to use? I can't think of it now. I was born September 8th, 1939. I forgot to tell you that. I just celebrated my 79th. I'm looking forward to the big 8 0. You know, different from that, don't tell me. But anyhow, uh, that's why I suspect. Because it was, you know, to, to fuel that ICBM, either the Atlas or the Titan was. And I, we'll go to some slides. I may have a picture of that, and you can see why. I, anecdotal, that's what I'm yeah. saying. It's anecdotal, but see, it came up from the archives. You get 79, it doesn't come out as fast. It doesn't come up as fast, but it comes up. That's why I say it's, I, I suspect that happened. Do you know what sort of adverse effects such a spill? So, the reason I ask this is because I know in the in the 40s, maybe it was in the early 50s, the um, the military. Well, in the 40s they were testing nuclear weapons out in Nevada, right? And there were issues in some some towns in Nevada where you had next generation children being. I'm wondering if there is that you're aware of any sort of adverse effects, whether it's with the local populations besides the four people that died. Yeah. Um, or environmental or anything like that? Or is uh, that kind of hush-hush? Well, I imagine it would there's, be. Two, there's two things. Um, 
Yeah, they would, if, if there was a spill, you know, it, it probably wouldn't get out yeah. to the media. And the other thing was, and, and you know, back then, you didn't have the environmental that you have now. EPA didn't come along until what? Nixon. Nixon? Yeah. yeah. So that's why I say it. I suspect that happened because of everything that they had to do to uh, refuel it. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you mentioned something about a boarding uh, missile launch. Uh, was that a solid fuel? Yeah, the Minuteman was solid fuel. Yeah. Atlas and Titan were liquid fuel. But you said you could abort a Minuteman. Oh, you could, okay. It's called Cancel Launch in Progress, CLIP. Insert the key, turn it, and assuming that everything is okay, the missile, and you're going to see it in the video, the ground, the ground hatch slides back and it starts to launch. But before it gets into what's called boost, Mm -hmm. You can you can shut it down going through this clip procedure, mm -hmm. and we gave that to the Russians. It fell safe. Yeah, because I I understood you could stop a solid fuel. Yeah, but uh, you can only stop it, you know, within <laughs> a minute, probably two at the most. Mm -hmm. If you're going to shut it down, boom, you have to do that. And in order to, you couldn't do that as a crew member. You had to get somebody to tell you to do it. <laughs> you had to verify and authenticate with them. Yeah. And that, that goes fast. Hmm. Okay? Anybody else? Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could talk more about Colonel Hall, because everything I read about him leads me to believe that he's one of the most unsung heroes. He is of the Cold War because, if I remember correctly, when he was told, go study solid fuel ICBMs, it was a joke because they everyone thought that solid fuel ICBMs was impossible. Right. But when we, you know, the Soviets had the R7, which was RP-1 locks, which required to be fueled. And so by developing the Minuteman, it completely changed the game because now, I know that we still use the Minuteman, so it's still classified, right. so don't tell me anything I won't go to prison for. But that by the 70s, we could turn the keys on a Minuteman so fast that they would be hitting the Soviet Union before the Soviet Union were done fueling their missiles. And that was one of the major things that yeah. contributed to... Well, I didn't realize that the Soviets were still using liquid fuel then. The RP-7 is locked, yeah. RP-1, like an Atlas. Yeah. Very powerful, but it takes a long time to fuel. Right. That's, that's yeah, he, well, he, he is, that's why I say he's the guy. He's, uh, I've got some information there that I can send you, which, you know, if you'll give me your contact information, I'll, I'll make a copy and send it to you. So, uh, what else? Yes, sir. What's your general impression about how safe these things were? I mean, somebody mentioned the Damascus incident, and you know, Eric Schlosser wrote this expose five years ago, giving the impression that it's just blind luck that we didn't blow ourselves up ten times over because of just how slipshod the kind of safety mechanisms were. And you yourself admitted that when you were put in command of this, that you didn't know what you were doing, and you were a young man. Well, uh, what is your general we'll go, sense of? Couldn't we'll go quite that far, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, you know, uh, that's why they give you a check ride after you've been there for not very long. And, you know, as I say, from my experience, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was pushed along because they needed launch officers. You know? And uh, the thing that, I didn't mention this, and well, it's in the bio, but the thing that really saved me when I met the board, believe it or not, was 
I got the Bronze Star for meritorious service in Vietnam. And these people on the board, you know, these would have been, this was 69, WW2 guys that were, and a lot of navigators because of missiles. There were a lot of navigators, ex-navigators. And at the board meeting, they said, well, Captain Wyman, I see here you've got the Bronze Star for meritorious service. I said, yes, sir. So they pulled me out of the capsule, but they went back and supplied. But um, for the most part, um, you know, I mean, there were some of us that just didn't have the ability. That's really all I can tell you. Did you feel that the safety mechanisms that they were in place were oh, yeah. were adequate and thorough, or do you go back and say, you know, it's no, a the safety view. the safety mechanisms it's it's a elaborate it's quite a lot and you'll see it in this five minute video mm -hmm. safety mechanisms are they're there in place the capsules it's hardened cable it's not even uh, analog <laughs> it probably is analog but it's really analog. And they're called the uh, ground-based strategic deterrent. It's going to be a complete revamp of everything. The missile, the capsules, and we're talking billions and billions of dollars. I mean, big time. So, no, I'm confident in the, in the, in the system. Motion, we watch the video so yeah. we have time to ask you questions yeah. about it? Let's yeah. go ahead and do that. The execution of nuclear weapons is responsibility. That noise in the background, you'll never forget that noise because that's that's the start of the launch. I'm receiving the launch the launch direction. The combat crew goes through a set of uh, procedures necessary Ryan, to validate. Can you put it on pause? To authenticate its origin. Uh, go ahead. Let's, come on, come on. Sure. And then to begin to interact with the weapon system uh, to enable it for the launch sequence to target it on its. Uh, Directed the judges in the one sequence. This is screens. a minute and three. Okay, put them on pause. You can't see, well, you can't see it, but they're wearing their, you know, their uniform, which is the same as pilot would wear. And on top of their shoulder, they have black oak leaf clusters. Okay, because the Air Force and the Army and Marines wearing combat uniform, an oak leaf cluster is silver, but it's black. Now, these two fellas are either squadron commanders, because they're lieutenant colonels, or they're uh, standard val standardization evaluation. You don't get a lieutenant colonel sitting in the seat of the capsule. I had one, and that's when I was taking the check route. And he kept looking over, and I finally looked up at him, and I said, Sir, as long as I'm in the seat, I would appreciate it if you back off a little bit. <laughs> he got mad. <laughs> I think that had something to do with it, but, you know. Okay. This, this is the cam on the missile launch checklist on 3-98. Three, step one, launch key inserted, previously accomplished. Click A option selected, zero, zero, 0051. This is in the capsule, 68 feet zero, underground. Five. Okay, step five, alignment mode, enter Mike. Mike. Step five, Alpha, enter Sierra in the Scion BOA field. Sierra, step six, initiate key press. Initiate. Minuteman 3 provides data management for our country. And so the whole idea is to create, uh, as we did during the Cold War, um, a political and military circumstance that serves our ultimate national security objective, and that is our survival. Step 17, all call enable procedure required. Great. On there, on page 3-103, launch menu from main menu selected, step one. Launch. Enable from launch pop-up menu selected. Selected. All call enable from enable pop-up menu selected. Like Unlock code entered. Juliet, Papa, Papa, November, Kilo, Foxtrot. Okay. 
have Julian Pop the Pop by November Kilo Foxtrot. That's good. Enable switch down and lock. Down and lock. Sure OID over the whiskey side. Whiskey. Step six, initiate key pressed. Initiate. Successful enable co op. I agree. All call enable is accomplished. Moving back to launch checklist. Agreed. Step 18 and launch actions at this time. Hands on keys. On my mark. Three, two, one. Mark. Hold. Bingo. Bingo. I have the LC message transmitted and released. The okay. LC message transmitted. At this point, they could do clip. Okay, now it's coming out of the uh, LF silo. You can still do quick here. Step 18 is accomplished. Step 19, launch switch is back to code used. Okay, we're waiting for LIP. I agree. Each combat crew is comprised of a commander and a deputy commander. They are typically company grade officers, highly trained. In this no, specific very operational very task on this white system. Code word for two 25-year-old kids. That's CES. They have in their custody, and they have as their responsibility, the unique task of providing operational support, security, and the execution of a nuclear weapon system. I have positive launch indications Alpha 02 through Alpha 11. <laughs> Okay, this is kind of, the music here is not appropriate. <laughs> Believe me. You, you could not do click here. It's beyond. so it's available for teaching purposes. Absolutely. Right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So um, we've got five minutes left for... Yes, please. Yes. Do you have that other slide on there about missile defense? There should be one all the way to the end. Yeah, that was the end. Okay. I'm uh, just going to talk to you for two minutes. As far as missile defense goes, you're hearing a lot about missile defense. Okay, this slide comes from Missile Defense Agency. And like I was saying, the stages, the boost, ascent, mid-course, and terminal. Now, of these four, which one do you think 
would be best for a uh, missile, a, a Minuteman to be knocked down. Which one of those stages do you think it would be best? Boost descent, mid course, or terminal? Best in what sense? That have the best chance of killing the, the uh, missile. Anybody? A low boost, mid course. Doctor is correct. The best chance is in the boost stage because in, in the actual boost stage, you know, it's it's out of the silo, but uh, you know, it's not in, really in a descent. And they're talk, they always talk about this terminal state. When that thing is in terminal, I mean, it's going fast. You know, there's been chaff thrown out. It's, there's heat. There's everything. So this is the best best time right here. And when you when you get the mid course, and what they're showing here is all these different the Aegis systems and the EKE emergency kill vehicle, and then this uh, FAD system, FAD Pack Three and Aegis to combine. But that's that's another day. Done a little research on that, but uh, we need domestic tranquility at home. Okay. So we've got a few minutes for questions that, that uh, are prompted by uh, some of these sobering reflections. Yeah. Can you, you want to show those those other slides? Brian? Sure. Real fast. Okay, there's there's the uh, fat the little boy and the fat man that was done I one at Oak Ridge was uh, Fat boy and, and uh, the little boy was at uh, Los Alamos. Okay, the top top slide is the launch center for the uh, Atlas Atlas missile. They're underground, and like I say, the launch center either had one or three missiles, as contrasted with the Minman, which had ten. Same way with the Titan II missile complex. Uh, next one. Okay, then the Minuteman, you know, like I say, it, you had 10, uh, you had 10 uh, ICBMs. This is, you can't really see it, but it's just, it's just simulating. This is the silo, and there's a launch control center, and you were responsible for 10 of the missiles. Now, uh, this is a, a cutaway of the silo. Capsule, the uh, support building, and so forth, and then you can see the, the other LFs, the other silos right there. Next one. The communication system. Uh, is, here's the launch control center. The controls. You can, you can get a message. This is different ways that you can get a message. Airborne launch command. This is a looking glass uh, right here just different ways you can get a long, a long message. Okay. Next one. Okay, and then there's, there's the Minute Man that takes flight. So right here, right in here, would be the best time to kill that missile. And you get into uh, ascent, this is mid-course, and at this point, when you just have the warhead, the re-entry vehicle, very difficult to knock that out. Okay? All right. So, I have a question about your your most your, your last point about the ascent being the best time. So I'm looking at this graph you have here. It says 120 seconds. The missile reaches an altitude of 300,000 feet. The second stage tail falls off, and I assume that's about the point where it gets into the middle, yeah. into the mid course. Right. Maybe I'm missing something, but how would anyone save somebody that was already located relatively close to the silo be able to shoot that down in two minutes? You know, uh, th that would require enemy forces to first be aware that it's even happening. Yeah. 
to launch some sort of countermeasures. Well, you see, effectively in two minutes, the, you see seems on, that, on that slide where it says the, the systems of elements. Well, they're using the from each system where that green is on the uh, boost. You know, that's Navy, and they use that, and they use the other each system shore when you're when you're mid course. That, that's really all I can tell you. Is there their job is to detect a launch that's, that, that either has happened already or will happen shortly. But if you can, that's the best phase to knock that missile out. Because when, see, you're, you're seeing right here, you're actually seeing the entire missile. But as you get into more of these stages, these are, you know, you get the separation. And finally, when you get over the turn, when you get over the term, terminal, you have, you have a war hit. And that, that's extremely hard to knock out, just the war hit alone. I, I guess, wouldn't it be, it, 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 maybe I'm just not understanding it correctly, but it seems to me that to get it at that early stage would be for all intents and purposes, technically impossible because of the distances involved and the need to react so quickly. You know, if uh, the Chinese or the Soviets or whomever, you know, even if they are, they recognize that a missile is being launched at the exact moment the the, the silo door opens, just to even get projectiles over there to knock it out. I mean, I don't think that's possible. I don't know. But it would be hard. I've read that, that currently from our base in Seoul that we we think that we can notice the North Korean launch within seven seconds. I mean, it's a very small window, but yeah. whether you could in the next two minutes you have left get your yeah, no. So I but could see that from American positions over in the Far East. Yeah, yeah. right. But I'm sitting here yeah, thinking, from Russia, where's a like, Chinese base that's yeah, going to exactly. notice something out of North Dakota or Missouri, yeah. you know, or or a Soviet, ba well, exactly. a Russian base now. Yeah, yeah. So, it would seem they, their only option. I think, I, I assume, based on what I'm learning, no, this would be actually, to knock it out in either mid-course or in the terminal stage. This is actually is very difficult. Al Quran, very germane. If you've read the Woodward book about Trump, Trump wants to pull out our bases from Korea, and yeah. all of his advisors are screaming at him, do you understand the difference between seven seconds and, and 15 minutes, which is what the difference between being sold and being in Alaska is. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it makes a huge difference. So on the subject of timing, one of our traditions is we always end exactly on time. But I don't want to force, I want to, don't want to foreclose any further discussion because I have this suggestion. Um, I have invited Mal to the uh, restaurant, the Thai restaurant across the street to have lunch, to thank him for his presentation. And um, if you'd like to join us, everyone would be responsible for their own meals. But if you'd like to join us, please uh, come along with us and continue the discussion there if that would be of interest. Please uh, join me in thanking Mal for a most stimulating and intriguing discussion.